I'm Steve Backshaw, and you're listening to the Aussie Wildlife Show. All right, guys, welcome to the Aussie Wildlife Show. Adrian here, and I'm here, of course, with Steve. Good day, guys. And we're very lucky today to have with us Sarah and Alex Holmes, zoologists, ecologists, and conservationists. Welcome, guys. Thanks very much for having us. Thanks very much. Great to be here. So you guys have come down from Mildura, and you're here to see Jane Goodall. We are indeed. Yep. We're very excited. Excited to see Jane, yep. I'm jealous. Very do, you reckon, jealous. do you reckon you can get her on the show? We'll do our best. <laughs> Thank you. You've got some business cards. There I'm we sure go. I'm sure she won't mind us <laughs> wheeling and dealing some cards yeah. her way. Have we not told you you're wearing T-shirts and hats and everything? Aussie <laughs> <laughs> wildlife. <laughs> everything. Fruit hats magnets. A lot. Yeah, fruit yeah. magnets. We'll, we'll get some merchandise there. on the way out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys, like us, are passionate about the environment. What got you involved in... You, you work, we'll talk about what you guys do, but what got you interested in the environment? So I guess as a child, I've always had a passion for, for animals and my childhood idol growing up was Diane Fossey. So my lifelong dream was to go and save the gorillas in Africa. And literally from from primary school, when a very close friend got to go and see the gorillas in, in Rwanda, it, it just really held a very strong place in my heart and going on through to secondary school I wanted to do vet science and thinking that I needed a vet degree to get to Africa and it wasn't until really going to uni and starting zoology that I realised well I don't actually need a vet degree because my passion's actually not the veterinary side of things it's actually conservation it's it's actually the animal behaviours. It's it's protecting these animals in the wild, and and I realised that it's actually the zoological field that I needed to take rather than that than that vet degree. And surprisingly, I kept along the path. And it wasn't until third year that, well, even um, at the end of third year, I finally got into vet science at Melbourne Uni and, and realised, well, actually, no, it's zoology I wanted to do, and, and declined going forward with veterinary science and and took on the zoological side of things and did my honours and finally got that dream to go to Africa and I guess it's it's just been a lifelong passion to firstly I guess do something with animals educate people about our local environment and for me having that big lifelong goal ticked it was very very emotional the day we actually got to see those gorillas up in Rwanda for the first time that would have been amazing absolutely I was gonna say mine's mine's a bit simpler I think I was one of those kids <laughs> that liked dinosaurs and I never stopped I just moved from dinosaurs to reptiles and just knew that that's what I wanted to do from a very young age. So I just pursued that zoological sort of dream, I guess. It took me a little while to work out exactly what I could do, but I knew I wanted to work with animals. So I, I had turtles and you know lizards and all sorts of things as a kid growing up, and uh, I just sort of pursued that, I suppose. When Sarah and I met, I already had a room full of snakes, so it just went from there, really. Crazy man. <laughs> <laughs> or crazy girl. Yeah, going, well, yeah. <laughs> Taking on that path. <laughs> it's interesting what gets people interested in the environment. People want to work with animals, but then you become a big picture person, Sarah, and you went like, well, I want to help the environment. And as did you, Alex. You both worked along the river, working with floodplain management. Yeah, like. that's correct. Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, sure. Well, um, I mean, obviously, the Murray-Darling Basin, um, we're sort of a little bit unique in Mildura being within a tri-state environment I guess we're right on the border of New South Wales we're only an hour from South Australia and then obviously placed in northwestern Victoria the Murray River's our lifeblood I guess and we've got so many agricultural industries and horticultural industries around Mildura it's, it's a huge economic enterprise so to speak but then from an environmental side of things you can see the environment suffering because of the whole water regulation within the Murray-Darling Basin and I mean obviously you know, in recent times with the massive fish kills along the Darling River. Um, I mean, it's such a political topic at the moment. And I guess having worked in that natural resource management field for a number of years, you see the various sides of the story. It's obviously when environmental watering, I guess, was introduced at a, at a community level. It possibly wasn't taken on board particularly favourably amongst our agricultural industry because obviously there was that competition for water and you know you can certainly see both sides of the story and obviously the Murray-Darling Basin as a whole doesn't function without water and you know it, I, I can't remember the statistics but it's such the Murray-Darling Basin produces such a high percentage of our food bowl literally within Australia like without 
without it, Australia doesn't exist from just a functioning point of view in food production. But then you can just see within the, the local landscape just how much it's declined because of the way we regulate the river. Yeah, and I think that's what was recognised probably 15 years plus ago, I guess, wasn't it, when they had the, there was that sort of early emergency red gum watering that happened in their area. So basically they set up a diesel pump and just pump water into wetlands because they realised that basically, particularly the red gum, were, were getting quite stressed uh, and they weren't getting that regular watering that they were used to or, or what they needed. So they reckon they need to be to, to be watered or receive water every two to three years, I think, as a as a sort of a minimum. So basically, the CMA, I think, along with the with or oh, they DELP now, got on board and put emergency water into these into these wetlands and waterways. So that I think then over time that got a little bit more, well they got they got a bit more strategic about it, and that's where companies like GHD, who I work for, looked into ways to actually, along with the CMAs, so the CMAs and, and DELP and also the Murray-Darling Basin Authority. They came up with um, different options to put in actual regulating structures, so permanent structures and, and pump stations to actually get that water in there. So it wasn't so much a, a quick emergency watering situation there, as there was actually dedicated infrastructure there to be able to water these these systems. So is it trying to replicate the original environmental flows? Yeah, basically, yeah. So, so a, of, a team of scientists will get together at the start and come up with a range of ecological objectives that's where we've gotten involved in the past. So myself and my team have gone out and done big baseline surveys. So to work out what's actually out there, what are those natural assets, what you know, specific threatened species exist out there. So, so west of Mildura, for example, there's things like, I think you call it the or green and golden bell frog, I think over here. We call it the growling grass frog. So yeah. the species like that that have uh, declined massively, and, and in conjunction with that, things like tiger snakes, red belly blacks, you know, things that feed on those large frogs. So we've seen a real reduction in abundance of those sort of species. So, you know, we'd go out and do baseline surveys, work out what species needed to be protected, go away and work out what sort of ecological objectives needed to be developed to actually basically cater for these species and, and those ecosystems. And then you can put in the infrastructure and, and design a water regime around those species. So that's what's happening up in our area. And you're talking about the red gums. They won't fruit and seed without inundation at some point. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, look, I'm, I'm not a red gum expert. When they're inundated, they will, you'll get that seed fall. And same with black box. So they need that regular inundation. Black box is a bit hardier. It's on a higher elevation on the floodplain. But they also will need that watering every sort of four to five years. So, so basically, that's what they were seeing with that over, over-regulation and lack of larger floods, we're seeing very stressed systems, basically, and then all the animals that depend on them as well. Because there would have been times before we started putting in all the locks where the water would have been almost not there, would have just dried right up at some points. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, and that's the times, problem because yeah. it's not just the river that's obviously and, and the vegetation associated directly with the river, but it's all those associated wetlands that once upon a time the ephemeral systems would have wetted and dried whereas now they're either completely disconnected from the river so they're just dry all the time or they're permanently inundated so you're not getting those wet dry cycles that particular vegetation needs to be able to reproduce but likewise the fauna's not getting those cues to reproduce so a lot of your water birds and your frogs and your fish aren't getting the cues that they once would have to be able to trigger breeding responses so you know, the vegetation suffering, but then as a result to the surrounding fauna ecosystems also declining because they're not getting those cues to reproduce that they once would. And it's also even just the cycling of the nutrients within those wetland systems that can obviously contribute to a healthier system. So, yeah, it's pretty dire in some instances, really. You mentioned earlier about the recent activities with all the fish dying, like millions of fish. What was that down to? Yeah, I think it was mainly low. I think what happened up up near Menindi was you're getting low flows and then there were blue-green algal blooms up there. And then, I, again, I'm not an expert on this, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I think what happened is it had been very warm and then all of a sudden we got a cold snap and the algae died and that basically deoxygenated the water. So all of a sudden you've got all these fish in small pools, all the oxygen stripped from the water, and they just died 
basically on mass in these little pools. So that was basically the situation up there. Very yeah. sad to see. That yeah, was it's quite nice. quite shocking. And that area of, of the darling, that sort of lower darling system, was actually a very good cod breeding nursery, basically. And the reason why they bred so well there, it was, it was just sheer luck. Like, they just happened to do releases at exactly the right time out of Menindi. And it actually matched up really well with the necessary breeding cues for cod. So it was a really good fishery through that area. It's a real shame to see it in that in that state at the moment. Alex, you mentioned the work you do with GHD and you do some EIS, yeah. environmental impact statements for the river. Do you work in other parts of the country in your role? Yeah, look, I, I do. We've got a we've got an office up in Darwin. I mean, we've got offices situated around Australia. And typically, when other officers need some assistance with some of their bigger surveys, they'll get us involved. So, yeah, we've got a really close affinity with the Darwin office. We have actually supported them over probably over the last 10 years with various surveys interstate. So a lot of work, and it's all sort of mining-driven. So we've done surveys sort of in the West McDonald Ranges, up in the Tanami, up around Catherine, and they're all uh, all impact assessments. So the survey we did up at Catherine, for example, we were looking at, at the time, it was the largest known breeding colony of Gouldian finch. So mm. it's quite a contentious uh, uh, mine expansion they wanted to do. So basically we went out and did surveys, worked out where the finches were breeding, you know, how abundant they were, and then try to come up with some various mitigation measures for, for that particular client to sort of assist them in, in their proposal. They're endangered, aren't they, those finches? They are endangered, yeah. I look, I think they've, I think more surveys now have sort of revealed that there are more populations around than they originally thought, but they still are a lot scarcer than they used to be. You know, they were in colonies of thousands in the past and now they're, they're only seen in maybe 100 would be a large colony. So. What are their biggest threats? Uh, they reckon, look, in the past, I think it was things like overcollection for aviculture. Look, I don't think that's, that's way back in the past. Mm. Uh, but the other one was they reckon there was an air sac mite. Now, whether it was introduced to Australia, but that was also a, a, an issue for them. But the other things, things like overburning, so, so burning basically their food source at the wrong time of year. So basically, I'll be looking for seed at a particular time of year. So if it wasn't available, you know, they were having to travel large distances and, and basically couldn't produce large clutches or couldn't get those babies through to, to fledging. So I think that's been a bit of an issue in the past. So fire regimes, damaging their hollows, that sort of thing as well. So Okay. Yeah. They're a stunning bird. They, they, they are beautiful, yeah. They breed well in captivity. There's lots in captivity. Yeah, yeah they do well in captivity, yeah. yeah. They're amazing to see in the wild. It's, uh, you almost can't believe that an animal would be that colour, really. So Yeah, yeah. yeah. No camouflage value there. <laughs> 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 and the West Max... I love the West Max. I spent yeah. two weeks living in Ormiston Gorge. Oh, really? You would have saw the, um, well, I call them the Black-footed Rock Wallabies. Ah, okay, they've yep. got a few names, haven't they? Yep. Black-flanked, I think, is the other one. So, yeah, they're oh, amazing little wallaby. Yeah, great spot. So you did some survey work there as well? Yeah, we did some survey work. I think that's probably, probably still the best survey I've ever done, I reckon. So... And another impact assessment, so there was a little population of rock wallabies on this particular site, but we wanted to try and work out you know, how many wallabies there were, are they breeding, you know, how extensive is that, is that colony. So we basically got a helicopter out and we had two teams that were on the ground doing that work. And we worked with a guy called John Reed, who was involved in setting up arid recovery out at Roxby Downs. He's coming over on Sunday. Is he? Fantastic guy. So he'd been involved in developing this rapid assessment method for yeah, the black-footed rock wallaby. So we got him on board. We used GIS to select a whole range of different sites that we were going to look at. Then we basically had teams of two getting airdropped to these sites, basically doing rapid assessments, looking for food plants, looking for fresh scats, um, you know, looking for juvenile scats for rock wallabies. So that was all basically just trying to work out where are the wallabies, what areas are they occupying, are they breeding, how close are they to the mine, the proposed mine, you know, what are the likelihood of air quality issues, noise, uh, those sort of things, what are the likely impacts of those on that population. Yeah, it was an interesting piece of work. Is it the mine that have to pay for that sort of stuff? Yeah, they do, yep. They get us to, they basically engage a, a company to, to develop that impact assessment process. So, and there's a whole range of different facets that have to be looked at. We've got things like anything from bush tucker, looking at bush tucker resources, cultural heritage um, uh, issues in the area and values. You know, things like that particular area, there, were, there was rock art in some of, some of the locations nearby. You know, you're looking at cultural food resources, things like that. Air quality, so looking at dust production from the mine, noise, light, all those different things have to be looked at. So it's quite an involved process, and it usually takes quite a few years to get their approval. Bush tucker feet, what's out there like? 
bush tomatoes, bush banana. Yeah, things like that, I think, yeah. Yeah, we had a, had a team out there working with the local traditional owners and looking at different food sources. Even some of the animals, they were using, obviously, sand goannas, looking at abundance of sand goannas and that sort of thing. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. That is interesting. Um, and you both have a business called Enviro EDU. I was talking to you earlier, Sarah, about your role with the river. You really enjoy the educational aspect of your role. And so you've set up a business like similar to what we do. You find that rewarding? Oh, Adrian, I absolutely love it. I do really pinch myself that I get to do what I do and work with the community um, and educate our local, um, not only school kids, I, I think it's really important. It's grassroots learning, I guess. It's getting kids to take home those messages to their families and um, a component of what we do is working with animals and we focus on local threatened species because we feel it's really important that people in our local area know what's in their own backyard and then the things, the educational messages that we like to share, they can then take on and, and spread elsewhere. So I guess our little catchphrase is learn local, act global. So, you know, everything that we do at a local scale can be applied at a national and an international level. So, you know, really simple messages can be applied everywhere. And, and I think that's, you know, having, having kids get that passion at a really local scale for me is really important. And then they can dream big, I think. I couldn't agree more. I like that. Someone said I should make a book just of this place. And I thought, oh, that's a bit... I mean, you've got so many beautiful places. Why just this place? But then I thought, like you say, the, the principles apply. Um, you know, just protecting the local Indigenous flora and the biodiversity. You could do that anywhere. So it does oh, apply absolutely. anywhere, doesn't it? absolutely. Everybody's yeah. got to play that little part, I think. Yeah, that's what it's all about, isn't it? If yep. each of us can do something little, it all amounts to something more I th- significant. I think so. yeah. And having the, uh, having the live animals, it really engages people, doesn't it? It's that first step, isn't it? It's, I think when it's that light bulb moment that you kind of need and the animals are a really good first step in that because obviously when it's hands-on and they can see what you're talking about, it's not just a picture in a book or it's not just a picture on a big screen, it's there in front of them. And you see it happening. You can walk into a classroom and you can see those little light bulb moments on on certain kids and you think, oh my gosh, this is why I do it. Because, you know, you think if that one or two little people in that classroom can then go home and share just even one message that you've taught them that day back at home. So, for example, the big one we've got locally is loss of habitat. I mean, it's, it's broad scale right across Australia, but for us, a lot of our local threatened species it's kind of twofold it's loss of habitat and it's predation by feral animals and camping's a massive thing locally for us and you know I always in the classroom we talk about our local we've only got one python locally the Murray Darling carpet python and you know loss of habitat's a huge threat to that particular species of python and you know I'll always ask the kids who loves camping and you know who loves to have a campfire and next time mum and dad find that big hollow log that you're going to put on your campfire what are we going to say to mum and dad stop you know someone else needs that big hollow log more than we do we can still have our our fire we can either bring our own firewood in or you know we just don't need to be taking the big hollow logs or cutting down the big trees for our for our fire and you know it's getting people to just think that little bit outside the box not just take the quick easy option all the time and 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 opening eyes to or opening people's eyes to other ways of doing things I think is the big thing so yeah Yeah, it's things like um our eldest son, his little friend, like that they they won't eat Nutri-Grain at their house anymore because he's like well that's got uh, palm oil in it so they've had this discussion and now they've decided, well, we're not having Nutri-Grain anymore, so there's no Nutri-Grain at that household. <laughs> <laughs> wow, if only your son knew what palm oil was in. Yeah, it's, it's a shock. A he, he got a very rude shock um, at a visit to the, was it the Melbourne Zoo, I think, yeah. and learning yeah. all about what palm oil is in yeah. and the extent of what it's in. And I think Taronga Zoo have just got a new exhibit, the Sumatran Tigers, I think it is, where you go on a ride in a sort of car make believe and it shows you around and it puts you into a supermarket after oh, oh, right. the wow. things yeah, on the shelf really, that you will yep. absolutely know are all these things that have got yeah like, and then they've got a bit where they're saying like congratulating companies on using sustainable palm oil yes and saying you know well done for this but you know it's, oh, it's most brilliant. of the labels don't actually have palm oil on and them. they mm. hide it because mm. they call it so many different yeah. names so mm. you you know unless you're completely yeah. up with the 130 different names for palm oil mm. you can't actually you just need to know the name of whatever the sustainable is yes yeah. probably sustainable palm oil. <laughs> <laughs> it could be. good label yeah. 
I well, still I remember that scene. Sorry, sorry I was just going to say, I still remember that scene. Of at, it was Attenborough. One of the, I can't remember which one it was specifically, but he's flying over this particular area in Borneo, which was originally just all rainforest. He was like, well, you know, 30 years when I was here, this was all just pristine rainforest. Mm. And it was just palms, this, this palm plantation, as far as the eye could see. And well, you could just see him almost getting a bit emotional about what he yeah. was seeing before him, you know. It's well, we went over to Borneo yeah. oh, I heard last year, Borneo. I think it was. Yeah. Like, for instance, we went to the Kinabantangan River, which is some amazing rainforest, some of the most beautiful things that you'll, you'll see. It's diversity of animals is amazing, insects, everything. It's beautiful. But you've got a two-and-a-half sort of hour drive from Sandakan Airport to get to that, oh, yeah. and the whole yep. drive is palm oil, yeah, like right. the whole way, and it is it's quite sad, isn't it? Mm-hmm. When yeah. you see that, you do spend a few days in this amazing place, but yeah, the drive there, you just think, wow, this is crazy. Yeah, yeah I think it's really sad that I guess as the human population grows, we're still to this day clearing biodiversity, and mm. no one really understands how. You can't put that back. Are you putting it down to population growth? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. But you, you, you can't put back <laughs> that biodiversity. Um, <laughs> I mean, and, and Australia's the same. I mean, you've, you've driven through South Australia. You've seen a lot of wheat and canola and sheep, and that all used to be bilby habitat. You know, it's yeah. called orangutan, mm-hmm. but it was numbats and... Yep. Betongs, and we don't have any betongs or numbats or bilbies in South Australia or Victoria. Victoria, no, exactly. that's right. You look at the museum records for Mildura, and there were, you know, Western Bar Bandicoots, bilbies, Western Quolls, brushtail betongs, burrowing betongs, the whole lot. Yep. They're all there. Yep. Uh, Same they're not here. there anymore. All gone. Uh, Do you guys still have feather tail gliders? Uh, apparently they are. There's not, 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 yeah, there's, there was okay. a. There was a um, deceased one found out at, I think it was either Walpola or Lindsay Island some years ago now. They could still be there, but none have come up on surveys recently. But we did get sugar gliders just east of Mildura a few years ago. So, so there are still a few gliders about in big enough forest on the um, yeah on the Murray. Okay. Yeah, but they're quite rare. Yeah. yeah, nice. What other threatened species do you have locally? Oh, there's a few pretty interesting ones. Like I, I love my reptiles. So there's a red nape snake, just a little smaller lapid. One of the really interesting ones is the mud adder or Davies banded snake. So some years ago, uh, and look, I saw this again. It was on a post on Facebook. There was a rumour that there were death adders in northwestern Victoria, and see, uh, creft actually did find a death adder at, at a place called Lake Boger in central Victoria. And this is back, you know, when he did his expeditions and things like that, you know, a couple hundred years ago, whatever it was. But they haven't been able to find a death adder in Victoria since. It was just this one animal. And they actually did go back to the museum records, I think, in London, and they found this. So this actual animal was recorded from Lake Boger, as, as bizarre as that seems. But there, were, kept, there was this persistent rumour that there were death adders in northwestern Victoria up at Walpola Island. Anyway, they eventually, I think Nick Clemen from, the, from Arthur Ryler Institute in Victoria went out there and they actually did a survey along with a few other ecologists and they found this, this Davies banded snake out there. So the nearest population of Davies is like, I think it's like four or 500 kilometres up in, in you know, central northern New South Wales. So you've got this funny little population right up in the northwestern corner of Victoria. So they're, I think they're listed as critically endangered. So... There's a few oh, little wow. records yeah, for them, it's yeah. It's quite disjunct, isn't it? Yeah, it's amazing. Bizarre. So, yeah, but there's a few other iconic species like mallee fowl, Corbin's long-eared bat, yeah, pink cockatoos or major Mitchell cockatoos. Yeah, there's a few key species like that around. So That's awesome. What about um, western hooded scallyfoot? Yeah, so we've we've actually got a couple that have laid us a uh, couple of eggs recently. So Pygopa schrader, I so eastern hoodeds, eastern hooded scallyfoot. So originally just a few little populations in Victoria. And there was actually one from Lake Ranfurly, right in Mildura. And unfortunately, we've done a few surveys for them over the last few years, and we haven't been able to find that population again. But there are good populations sort of out towards the South Australian border that have since been found. So, yeah, that's another threatened species from the area. I, uh, I'd like to take you out of Australia now. <laughs> <laughs> or in Australia. <laughs> as well, your, your other <laughs> travels all, all around the world as well, you've done a lot. Yeah, we've been fairly fortunate pre-children to do a fair bit of travel around oh, around the world. Children, <laughs> no, seriously. Um, hoping to instill a bit of the same passion to, for travel, hopefully, that the kids will want to join us on some expeditions down the track. But, yeah, we were quite lucky. We did do a little bit of work in, in Southern Africa some years back, probably 
saying our age now, age, really. Age three or four or something. Like but, yeah, was, we yeah. were really fortunate to work in uh, KwaZulu-Natal um, in a couple of the game reserves there. So Giants Castle, we did uh, a month's work uh, looking at um, oh, various things, looking at mapping some of their endemic populations. They don't have any of the big five, so it was very much the ungulates that they were quite interested in. But the big one over there is poaching. So actually just going around... Um, with the rangers monitoring poaching activity. So that was actually almost a bit nerve-wracking, them them walking around with their big Mm. AK, whatever it is. Yeah, it was just out of this world, to be honest. Yeah, they're Um, right on the border with Lesotho, I think. So so they get a lot. Yeah, they'd come in over the range and come and steal people's cattle or different things like that and go back over the range to Lesotho. Yeah, it was quite quite interesting, quite an eye-opener from from our world, our safe world of national parks. The poachers would come and steal people's cattle, you say? Yeah, they'd steal cows and and game and things like that. But they were actually poaching a lot of the game game within the reserves. So it was... Yeah, I mean, people die. That you know, there's the mm. green line that you know people put their lives at risk, basically, from a ranging point of view, to protect their native population of, of animals over there. It's it's amazing. Yeah, it's oh. pretty sad now because I think the there were good rhino populations when we were over there, and since we just keep hearing stories of you know white rhinos being poached in, in other reserves we, we, that we visited that had good populations back then it's, yeah, it's, it's really sad what's happening down there i'll just do a quick plug for the episode we did with dr wayne boardman yeah that was um, a he, he's a wildlife vet and i can't remember what number episode it is but you can google wayne boardman and he, he he's got an interest i won't tell it but he, he did some work with a, a gorilla over there and talks about the poaching and think but they, these people put their lives on the line so yeah it was a yeah he worked with fossey and that didn't he i think some yeah, of the, I think some amazing. of the gorillas that Fossey had worked with, he worked with. He'd worked yeah. with. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it's, it's really amazing. And, you know, you read about it and, and to actually be there and physically see what these amazing people are doing on a day-to-day basis for, for wildlife is absolutely phenomenal. And an absolute credit to them. I mean, they're mm. literally risking life absolutely. and limb for, the, for these wildlife, which is... Yeah, they don't, they don't get paid well either for what they do. So no, and they, and they risk the life and limb of their families too absolutely. by being there. It's yep. it's and yeah, absolutely. We had it said on the show, as Dr. Charlie Manola said, um, we're the problem, but we're also the solution. Mm. And it's um, it's always good to look at that. I mean, it's really easy to throw your hands in the air and say, oh, people are just horrible. But there's also people like you guys and people like Diane Fossey and these people that do things. And I think if um, if people were to disappear tomorrow, I think we'd lose a lot of species. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And I think it's the way, it, it's it's being clever about the way you do things. And I know, you know, you can look favourably or unfavourably at certain ecotourism, I guess. But the gorillas, for example, I mean, I think for a lot of the locals, and, and I mean, poaching's still an issue over there. But I think it's for the local people to realise the, the dollar value of some of these animals and... I guess really diehard conservationists can look at people going in and into these opportunities to go and look at gorillas and obviously there's a risk to the gorilla populations I mean that we were really fortunate the the group we the group we were meant to go and see actually I think a poacher had been and they'd fled and they'd fled across the border into the Congo so there was a massive risk of this particular group actually surviving just being in the Congo full stop um, and so we were taken for the first time to a different group of gorillas. No one had actually gone from a tourist perspective to see this group of gorillas. Um, Alex actually got result, charged as a by result, the I was charged <laughs> in about two seconds. Whoa. As yeah, as so rocked up. The guy was like, "Stop, stop, stop!" And I had like a monopod for photography, and he was like, "Put it down, put it down." And I just had to stand like with my head lowered. Um, because this large silverback had sort of seen us rock up and I was literally sort of barreled. fairly tall and I had to, you know, That's crouch a down. That's huge animal to be coming at you. Yeah. Oh, I'll tell you what, I was, yeah. yeah. It was pretty phenomenal. I a, I, luckily, I, I had a spare pair of jocks. And I, no. yeah. <laughs> so I just ran right at you. Yeah, like it was a mock charge. I mean, he didn't, he didn't get really close, but he did come close more rapidly than I would have preferred. Anyway. I've seen him do it on TV. There's a, there's a four-part series that's pretty old now but it's on the congo oh right um and uh, but there's the there's the making of it i think we watched it steve yeah um and the guy's in a hide and he gets charged and he yeah he and he's on his own talking to his camera and he's like 
Oh. <laughs> I mean, it's there's nothing like it. No, yeah. it's, oh, no it's it's primal primal instincts <laughs> kicking in. I think <laughs> they're, they're amazing. Like the size of these silverback gorillas, they are amazing. I bet, I bet he could smell your fear. Oh, I reckon he probably could. <laughs> <laughs> I reckon he could. Yeah, so that was that was pretty amazing. So we've been we've been fairly lucky to have some pretty amazing wildlife encounters, I guess, internationally. We we did a little bit of work with the Charles Darwin Research Station in the Galapagos. Um, we were mapping endemic plants over there amongst the various islands, and a lot of it was GIS based. But we were pretty fortunate to do a couple of field trips to a couple of the islands. Um, yeah, most amazing was El Sado. It's uh, the biggest island is Isabella, which is basically made up of a chain of, well, some of them are still active volcanoes, but uh, El Sado has the largest population of giant tortoise uh, in all of the Galapagos. There's about 4,000 tortoises there. It was just amazing. Like we stepped out there. We were supposed to be working, but it was impossible to just concentrate the whole time. You were riding tortoises. It was ridiculous. <laughs> there, were, there were tortoises in our in our quadrats. <laughs> you know, there was Galapagos hawks. You know, landing right nearby, checking wow. us out. It was just unbelievable. The yeah. other botanists up there are like, "Oh, where are these Aussies? My gosh!" And we'd be there with these cameras, and you know, you you're two feet from these animals because they haven't yet been exposed, and they don't have the fear of humans yet so you know they're not you know this this Galapagos hawk that we were literally two feet from you did you didn't need a big lens you were right there in its face and yeah, we had to be ultra efficient with our surveys <laughs> to make up for our yeah. <laughs> touring around as we were going <laughs> but so they wouldn't just... get frustrated with us the Ecuadorians would they were happy with us I think in the end because we we got the survey done earlier than, <laughs> than they planned but yeah we had to be super efficient in between <laughs> but you got time you got um time with Lonesome George yeah we got to see uh George yeah. yeah before he passed away so I think he might have passed away the year after um so he was just based there at the Charles Darwin research station uh he was in his little corral and I used to go up there every morning to see if I could see him active and he'd always be sulking in behind his bush and you could just see his shell sort of poking out but I do remember there was this one uh morning where it was raining and I went up there and he was just charging around the corral chasing these, I think they were wolf volcano subspecies, these giant tortoise they were trying to pair him up with. And I, I don't think he ever actually, he, he never actually made it with these females. So unfortunately that uh, race was lost, I think. So um, yeah, he was death. the last yeah. of that. Yeah, yeah the, the Pinter Island, yeah. Mm. Sad. Yeah, it was sad. How, uh, he was so old, wasn't he? I can't remember what he... I don't, what yeah. they suspected he was, but yeah. yeah, I'm not sure what his age was. Amazing. But he was found as an adult, yeah, on Pinter when they did some surveys there. Yeah, some quite a few decades earlier, I think. So, do you think they'll ever find any more? I don't think they'll find any more Pinter, but look, you never know because they found. So I think California Academy of Science uh, recorded a tortoise on Fernandina, which is the youngest island in the archipelago. So it's the one. So there's a. a there's a, a vent on the sea floor in the northwestern corner of the Galapagos, and that's basically where the islands form, and then the island mass moves to the southeast. So all the islands in the southeast of the archipelago are the oldest. So Fernandina is still quite young, and it's still erupting, and you know it's it's a it's a pretty amazing, you know, pretty primeval sort of place. But they found this tortoise, and I think it was subspecies Phantasmus or something like that. So it sort of had that, you know. You know, it was almost like a mythical make beast, yeah, make-believe sort of animal. But they've recently actually found Fernandina tortoises, so they just needed to go and look a bit, a little bit more, because it's quite sort of active and the landscape's moving all the time. But they found they found the Fernandina tortoises living up so, there, yeah, amongst active volcanoes. So you never know; they could yeah. maybe maybe the Pinto race is still alive, but yeah, it's probably doubtful. But yeah, mm. it'd be nice to imagine it. Um, speaking about endangered animals, you guys recently got a brush tail bet on. We did. We're very, very lucky, very spoilt. Wesley, Wesley the brush tail bet on, or Wesley the woily. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's, he's amazing. We're, um, he's about five months old. Um, still, obviously, getting used to being handled, and you know, we're, we're hoping to be able to have him as a little education advocate for. The threatened species and an amazing conservation message, obviously, because we just don't have that critical mass weight um, 
marsupial around our area anymore. They're all extinct. And, you know, to think that we're so fortunate to have this little um, mascot, so to speak, and to be able to, to share the messages of why we no longer have these, what's caused their extinction locally, um, can send a really powerful message from an educational side of things to our local community. And, um, you know, there's lots of organi organisations doing some pretty amazing work and, and even locally to us, um, AWC are doing some reintroduction, well, they're, they're setting some exclusion plots to be able to reintroduce a lot of those smaller or mid-size marsupials back to our area. And, you know, I, I think it's fantastic. And, and from a community perspective and an educational side of things, for us to be able to share that, I feel really, really lucky. So Yeah, it's just one of those animals that no one's ever seen. You know, you or show, heard of, what's, even what's heard of, let alone oily? seen. No, nobody so. knows what it is. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, extinct in Victoria, extinct yeah. in South Australia. And zoos don't tend to have them. I mean, unless it's in a nocturnal house because they sleep during the day in a nest. Exactly. Mm. They make so you don't like, see them. Yeah, carrying stuff in their tail. So, they're, yeah, they're a boring exhibit. I mean, there's eight right there, but you can't see any. <laughs> 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 yeah. no, that's great. I think it's great that you guys specialise in some of your local threatened species and you're so knowledgeable. It's a great thing that you guys do on all fronts of your lifestyle. We'll put some information about Enviro EDU on our site. So if people want to book you guys to come out and talk to the school kids or even adult learning and I'm sure you do stuff like that as well. Yeah, oh look, thank you that would be wonderful. Yeah, we absolutely do I mean, um, we, I mean Alex is very into, uh, I mean his reptiles and he's talked a lot about his herp knowledge but he's also really knowledgeable on birds. Um, I'm learning my birds through him but yeah, we do, I, um, I work with the Catchment Management Authority in terms of educating people. I'm doing some bird watching, um, not so much surveys, but there's community, that citizen science is becoming a huge thing at a, at a national level. And a lot of the Catchment Management Authorities are really promoting that at a local level. And, and look, I think it's great. I think it's one way that communities can get out there and actually contribute something, learn something as they're going along. And I think it's that learning and their contribution that I, c I think can really foster that passion for the for local conservation and so um, this, our local catchment management authority, the Mallee CMA, they, they do a lot of citizen science based projects and I'm quite fortunate to work with them on, on a number of those and yeah, we're rec recently we did a bird watching citizen science based project where community groups can actually go out and monitor birds and particularly with environmental watering projects that are a really big thing within our area it's a great way to bring knowledge back from a I guess for these catchment scale projects because it's not always feasible and and you know these government organizations don't always have huge buckets of money for monitoring and it's probably the biggest downfall with a lot of these amazing on-ground works is the follow-up monitoring so if you can get community um, interest to actually and of course it's not going to replace the really scientifically robust monitoring programs and I think everyone's you know everyone's realistic that there's limitations when you've you know got members of the public doing particular things but I think it's an amazing tool that can feed into other really robust programs so yeah I'm all for it and and I think it's just a really great way to get community of all ages on board you know kids can get involved at a school level schools can really grab some of these projects and take ownership of them but then you can have the elderly you know retirees that are looking to get out in the bush more it's a great way to fuel their excitement to get out on board as well so. Yeah, it's amazing what you learn too. Like uh, other people are like, oh, I saw this, or you know, I saw this particular species. Yeah, you know, I did a presentation down at Sea Lake on on the Murray Darling carpet python, because amazingly, there's there's the Tyrrell Creek in that area. It's surrounded by cropping country, but it's just this little channel working its way through the cropping country with these big old black box, and it, it's it's got a really good population of, of Murray Darling carpet pythons on that on that creek line. So it's quite amazing. In fact, it's, they're a very rare snake. It's the only place I've ever seen one in the wild. So I was stoked to see one, of course. But uh, after I gave this presentation, we went out and did some spotlighting. And look, there was never, there was never a high chance we were going to see a snake, but it was just nice to be out in their habitat. And we saw a few barn owls and things like that, so we were able to chat. But one thing I did do is I had a chat to one of the, one of the farmer's sons. You know, he was really interested, and we were talking reptiles and all that sort of stuff. 
And he was like, oh, yeah, look, you know, there's, I've seen a few of these at my place and I've seen you some photos and, oh, there's a couple of other birds I wouldn't mind you having a look at and tell me what they are. And, you know, like a week later he sent me all these emails and sent me photos of, of all these pythons he'd seen on his property. It was just amazing. It was awesome. You know, you could just see his, his mind ticking over and how excited he was about it, you know, how he could get involved and what he could do on his property. So, you know, some of that citizen science stuff is great, I reckon, you know. It absolutely is. We, we have a guy called Phil Ropeman from the Discovery Circle here in Adelaide puts together bio blitzes. And people are welcome to come. They're free. People book in. They do the bat walks. They have the anabat recorders. And uh, people do plant walks, ecology walks. Reptile experts come. I do a few talks with different animals. So there's a lot of different things. So you're going to pick up somebody. You're going to engage somebody, maybe the bird watching walk. or Yeah, exactly. Um, oh, yeah. It's, it's, it's really quite invaluable, I think, to, to get some of those messages out to a broader community base, really. Yeah, fantastic. Get the interest up for these animals. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah that's right, because, you know, you never know when someone might have seen something or, you know, they can help you out a little bit with your survey, give you some local knowledge. You know, I think it's a great way to, to get people involved. So. And for them to realise the significance of some of that. I think, you know, sometimes when it's you're in your own backyard, you don't realise the significance of what you might see regularly or, you know, I think it's fantastic when you can get that input that otherwise wouldn't be available. Yeah, so. especially with some of these farmers that have mm. got hundreds of hectares and things, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. They probably yeah. don't realise that some of that stuff may be endangered. Yes, it's awesome, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, it's interesting how some endangered species are really common in small pockets and um, some of the plants I've got here are really threatened species. There's a lot of botanists around that have never even seen some of these things, so um, yeah, quite right. Um, guys, Thank you so much Thanks. for coming over and giving us your time. Thank well, you so much for having, for having us. us. It's an absolute yeah. pleasure to meet you both. So really thanks very, it. very much. Yeah, awesome. Thank you, guys. Thank you. And thank you for listening. Thank you.